a pioneering filmmaker and activist, Pat Rocco produced and exhibited the first openly gay erotic films and gay-related newsreels in the 1960s that were widely embraced by the gay community and mainstream press. Come of Age was directed by a man named Brad Kingston. It is a side note entry in the history of gay erotic cinema, but it becomes an interesting subject piece when you discover that Brad Kingston was actually Pat Rocco. What turns you on? Well, come on, what turns you on, Cassidy? Well, several years ago, I used to have this little pool cleaning outfit that I ran. I used to service some real nice places on the west side of town. In more ways than one, too. It was a good way to get settled when I first came to the city, but it sure wasn't a way to get rich. So I gave it up after a while. While I was doing that, though, I had several helpers. None of them stayed too long except for one. He stuck around for almost a year. Hell of a nice guy, and we hit it off pretty well. I often wondered what happened to him and how he made out. Jim Cassidy? was one of the most popular and famous actors in both gay and straight adult entertainment from the Los Angeles area. And be it clothed or unclothed, he gained a massive following through photo shoots, films, and an incredible physique. On this episode, we're going to celebrate and scratch the surface of Pat Rocco, a truly pioneering photographer, filmmaker, activist, and important figure during the sexual revolution whose work is barely recognized today in the narrative of gay history. Come of age, filmmaker Pat Rocco's first dive into the hardcore erotic entertainment market, and we're going to celebrate Rick Cassidy, an East Coast amateur who became a physique model, popular cover model, and adult entertainment during the golden age of erotic cinema. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Pat Rocco was born Pasquale Vincent Sarapica in Brooklyn, New York on February 9, 1934, and lived there until his family moved to California when he was 11. His father was a draftsman, and his mother, a homemaker and movie fan, would take young Rocco to see films whenever she wanted to see the latest blockbuster. This started Rocco down the entertainment path, watching double features, stage shows, and Hollywood films. As a teenager, Rocco also sang on television talent shows. Rocco would attend Pasadena City College, but never took any kind of course in film or acting or camera, although he always had an interest in photography. In 1967, Rocco answered an ad placed by Victor Associates in the free press asking for someone to take male physique pictures. It started with that, and then it went to, I took along an 8mm movie camera with me, and I'd make a, a, I'd shoot a little a 8mm film when I was shooting the, still, the stills. Rocco made a brochure and advertised it in the free press, and from there turned it into a successful mail-order business. Screening during a sensitive time in Los Angeles, Rocco quickly began to see the injustice and censorship that would follow his programs as well as the gay community. What you have just seen is an actual arrest right here at nightclub called the Meat Market. I believe the owner is being asked also to uh, attend the jail services, I would say, and he's on his way, police officer at the door. I think it's another example of what might be considered a form of police harassment, and uh, I will go on record as saying that, and obviously I'm going on film as saying that. Rocco presented positive pictures of gay life and love in his films. All the while, he was armed with a film camera. Rocco also began to document important events during the gay liberation movement that increased after the Stonewall riots of June 1969. Thanks for being with us. Good night. Rocco did enjoy celebrity during his time, and one of the most flattering 
was spree. Was the Society of Pat Rocco Enlightened Enthusiasts. It was started <laughs> by a, 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 one of the people who became a fan. I said, all right, go ahead, you have my blessing. And that started something that lasted for 10 years. And the fan club itself started a film workshop. And that's how the game came about. Founded in June 1969, Spree was comprised mainly of gay men and various female demi-stars that was intended to encourage more people to make films with artistic and gay integrity. Within a year or so of its founding, it veered away from its original intent and shifted toward stage production performed by its resident company with gay and usually comedic plots. They would also screen some of Rocco's films. In stark contrast to the sexually charged symbolism of someone like Kenneth Anger or the whatever of Andy Warhol, Rocco's films were sentimental. His films were about attractive young men holding hands, walking through shady woods and kissing, rarely showing anything explicit. Nevertheless, showing two males kissing was considered daring when he made these films. His entire career, Rocco was a director, writer, editor, and sound man, having total control. One of the most controversial films Rocco made was Discovery. Shot in 1968, the film takes place in Disneyland and follows two young men naked and kissing on Tom Sawyer's island, ending with them holding hands and walking out of the park. Shan Sales and Monroe Beeler asked to see his work. He showed them both a few hours of his films, to which Sales replied, these don't belong in a private collection. They belong on the screen. They're good enough to show and we'd like to start the Park Theater with them. Rocco's films were reviewed by mainstream publications like Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, Life, and Esquire. Rocco's prolific output of erotic films slowed down in the early 1970s as gay erotic films began to shift to hardcore. Rocco had a hard decision to make. This is what the audience wanted to see. He was offered a significant amount of money by sales and his business partners to make a hardcore feature, but Rocco refused. His personal belief was showing the complete sexual action was not necessary to make the story real. When Monroe Beeler left Shan Sales and Continental Theaters, he began his own Jaguar Productions and once again tried to persuade Rocco to make a hardcore film. Only this time, Rocco agreed and made a number of hardcore films under the name Brad Kingston. As Kingston, Rocco maintained his innocent approach, but the audience passed him by. Rocco continued his activism later in his career, covering gay events and as a director of the Hudson House, an emergency shelter for members of the gay community in Hollywood, California. I started the first shelter for homeless gay men and lesbians who, as gay men and le lesbians, when they went to other shelters that were for everybody, when they needed help they'd be, and they were homeless, would get beat up and robbed and kicked and spat upon and yelled at and all those good things. And it was terrible. Mom's Home Cooking is the type of restaurant you could expect to see on a street corner in any American town. What's unique about Mom's is that it may be the first restaurant ever run by the homeless for the public. Pat Rocco got the idea for Mom's because he runs several shelters for the homeless. He says instead of just feeding the homeless and giving them a place to sleep, giving them a chance to make money really made sense. In the early 1980s, Rocco and his partner moved to Hawaii the couple would return to Los Angeles years later. On November 8th, 2018, Pasquale Vincent Serapica, Pat Rocco, passed away at the age of 84. This wall is pictures rather than trophies. And these are friends, people I've worked with and friends and all that kind of thing. And this is how the pictures go. I'm turning, I'm turning. They're still clear up in that corner. They're still way up in the sky over there. 
They're going around and keep gotta... going. And then, and I hope the camera's following. And then they're over on that side of the room. And then they keep going around that side, the top of that room. And then finally we get to go, get back to go. In 2021, filmmakers Charlie David and Morris Chapdelaine released the documentary Pat Rocco Dared, featuring some of the last interviews with the prolific filmmaker. Do yourself a favor, find it and watch it. Find Pat Rocco films online and watch them. For too long, Pat Rocco, like many of the pioneers of the sexual liberation movement, have been a footnote. But they deserve to be front and center. Through his photography and early films, he dared to show depictions of men in love. As an activist with his camera rolling, he has provided some of the only existing moving image documentation of the major beginnings of the gay rights movement in the United States. His collection consists of approximately 700 items, including erotic shorts and home movies. Several of his films have been restored by the Outfest UCLA Legacy Project for the LGBTQ moving image preservation. Watch, see what happens. We'll all find out together. Bye for now. Pat Rocco was a pioneering photographer, director, and documentarian during the early days of the gay liberation movement. While he began his career photographing physique models, he soon moved into making loops of men kissing and holding hands, which was a very controversial thing to do in those days. Rocco found success with his films, but then the market began to shift when the audience was ready for the next big leap. Hardcore. Rocco's business partnership with Chan Sales and Monroe Bueller, the porno kings of the West, gave him the spotlight his films needed to be successful. But when Shan Sales asked Rocco to produce hardcore films, Rocco declined. No matter how much money was thrown in his direction, he declined. And so his presence in the market he helped create dissipated. When Monroe Bueller left to start his own company, Jaguar Productions, he used many of his contacts from his time with Continental Theaters. One of those contacts was Pat Rocco. Bueller made the decision to once again ask Rocco to think about directing a hardcore gay erotic film. And this time, Rocco accepted. He did, however, direct it under the name Brad Kingston. His first film would become of age. So we begin with this innocent looking young surfer type named Ron walking down a crowded street. Ron is a recent transplant from Nebraska. Ron immediately bumps into another guy, Mark, who offers to give our protagonist a ride to Hollywood. Ah, such simpler times. Decided to come out to LA, maybe find a job. Well, have you found one yet? No, I can't say that I have. Well, that's too bad. Hey, well, listen, I think I have a possibility. We get back to my apartment, I'll call a friend of mine. I think he can line up a job for That'd you. Be great. Oh, oh, now we're going to Mark's apartment. I have a great idea. I had planned to spend the weekend at the mountains. I have a cabin up there I use occasionally. And I think that's what we'll do. We'll go up there. Oh, well now we're going away for the weekend. Jeez, this guy works quick. Mark makes good on a job opportunity. Meanwhile, Ron looks around the room before taking a shower and finds some money. He decides to leave it. Mark decides that he's going to take a shower with Ron. And then Mark goes in for the win. Say, you know, uh, you've really got a groovy body. Mark and Ron drive up to Mark's cabin. When they get there, we find out Mark doesn't allow anyone to wear clothes in his cabin. Is this, <laughs> is this really what things were like in the 60s and 70s? I'm asking. Please let me know. Mark and Ron then share a cozy moment by the fireplace. The next morning, Ron has cooked breakfast for Mark. Then the two frolic naked in the woods. Two other hikers, Tom and Ralph, run into Mark and Ron. After being a bit reluctant to their intrusion, Mark and Ron join them, only to find the two engaging in some pretty steamy stuff and watching. The four then frolic back to Mark's cabin, have a good time, and then the movie ends. Well, I guess you could say you certainly have learned a lot in the last few weeks. Yeah, you could say that. 
experiences with you and the guys and cabin and the job, everything else. It's just everything's falling into place. And it's just really been a good time. One might say I've sort of come of age. Hey, that's the title of the film. The sound for Come of Age is decent, although most likely dubbed. But the film did have a good amount of heavyweights behind it when you look at the credits. The film absolutely feels like a Pat Rocco film. It's sentimental and relaxing. It's shot very much like a softcore film until you see the typical fare for hardcore erotic films. Sometimes you can feel the reluctance of the filmmaker as the viewer. Come of Age was released in 1971 and most probably screened at the Century Theater for its premiere. While it is not the best film, it is significant to Rocco's career, which had previously only been made up of romantic and softcore films. Rocco had an eye for what made cinema work and incorporated elements of gay men's lives into a layered fabric, although it was less explicit than his contemporaries. Rocco, as Brad Kingston, would follow Come of Age with films like A Dream of a Body, A Deep Compassion, and Get That Sailor. I'm Jim Cassidy of Signature Films. Jim Cassidy was born Richard Edward Siesniak Jr. on July 22nd, 1943, in New Jersey. He was raised in Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania. Cassidy was raised in a Roman Catholic family and remembered his childhood fondly, climbing trees and running around in the woods. At 14, inspired by actor Steve Reeves, Cassidy pursued an interest in professional bodybuilding, lifting weights, and participating in sports. One of the memories Cassidy had was an interest in pornography at a very early age when he found two erotic films his uncle hid in his bar. In an interview, Cassidy said he took them home and ran them until they fell apart. Cassidy wasn't aroused in what he was watching. He was more interested in the way the models appearing in the film would act. What made people act in them? How were these films made? Cassidy would watch her bloopers and inconsistencies, or when a model would look to the side for direction, not knowing that one day he would be on that side of the camera. I can't wait to see our names up there right on the screen, right? After graduating high school, Cassidy enlisted in the Navy and after two years, returned to Pennsylvania before beginning his modeling career. In 1970, Cassidy would meet Pat Rocco, who told him to participate in the Groovy Guy contest. Cassidy would come in third place, but became more popular than the first and second place contestants. Rocco would ask Cassidy what his stage name would be, to which he replied, Butch Cassidy. That would immediately be shut down by Rocco and go with the name Jim Cassidy or Rick Cassidy. Cassidy would make his screen debut in Mondo Rocco, a documentary by Rocco. He was then contacted by Tom DeSimone to be in Monroe Beeler's film, AMG Story, a somewhat hardcore documentary about Bob Miser's beginnings in 1946. We're here today to film the operation of AMG Studios. AMG Studios is the oldest professional studio in the world. It specializes in male films, and it is owned and operated by Mr. Bob Miser. Cassidy would serve as the host of the film. Cassidy found Miser's treatment of the models disconcerting and the idea of working gay porn unappealing. I didn't disturb you or anything. You don't have a couple tricks in there, do you? No, it's okay. I'm, I got a couple, but they're already finished. Oh, good. Hey, is that the film? Yeah, yeah, I just got it from the lab. Fantastic. Did you give me any trouble on it? No, nah, I told him it was uh, some home movies that I had shot on my vacation in Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> Can great, you believe that? Great. That same year, Cassidy would star in a bisexual film called Drilled Deep. 
The film had no sound and starred Cassidy, Dakota, a fellow part-time gay porn star who Cassidy met at Gold's Gym, and a model named Judy Coleman. Drilled Deep, directed by Scott Masters, became a hit. Cassidy and Dakota would go on to work together in two more loops and a number of photo shoots. Hey, where were you last night? Oh, I had a late date. Why, uh, did you miss me? Yeah, go to hell. Come in. Hey, look who it is. Cassidy appeared in several straight and gay films during the first half of the 1970s, mostly straight, and tried his hand at producing and editing as well. His straight films were under the name Rick Cassidy. Unlikely the slight name change fooled anyone, but in that pre-AIDS era, at the end of the swinging 60s, crossover between straight and gay porn was quite common and not much commented on. In the summer of 1974, he appeared on the stage at the Hollywood Center Theater in a production of Tub Strip, directed by Jerry Douglas and co-starring Casey Donovan. He would be replaced halfway through the run. By the end of 1974, Cassidy semi-retired and returned to Pennsylvania to become a real estate agent. He did manage to pop up in magazines and appear in small film roles. Is someone there? Good evening, Tasty. The minister says we'll be working together now. You under me. Shall we uh, rehearse a little, huh? Cassidy would return to porn in 1984 and appeared in a handful of straight films alongside Marilyn Chambers, Ginger Lynn, and starred in a little film called New Wave Hookers starring Tracy Lords. If you're not familiar with that whole scandal, it was a huge scandal, resulting in investigations and a lot of heat. After that ordeal, Cassidy decided to retire from the adult entertainment industry for good. Cassidy moved back to Pennsylvania and continued his work as a real estate agent. Jim Cassidy, Richard Edward Siasniak Jr., died on December 23, 2013, at the age of 70. Cassidy never really wanted to be in films. They would just come his way. He would get a phone call and work out a deal. All of his contracts were verbal since at the time making these films were illegal. I've asked you to stay because, well, I have hopes for you. Yes, out of all my senior year students, you're the only one that has any aptitude to become a champion. What I thought we'd do would be to run through some of the basics, limber up, and uh, generally get to know each other. He preferred softcore films because it was more acting, but they were way harder to come by. Cassidy appeared in around 100 adult features and sex loops in total, plus made the occasional non-adult film appearance. Interviews and articles after his career do not exist. However, we can only hope Cassidy would have seen the appreciation for his contributions to the adult entertainment industry from his adoring fans. Boy, I think this guy should get star billing for this number. <laughs> what do you think? That's for sure. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I'm your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on X, Facebook, Instagram, Substack, Threads. And if you like what you're watching or listening to and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, where you can support this podcast and YouTube channel, and I can continue making content like you've just enjoyed. As always, don't forget to subscribe, give this video a like, leave a comment, and let me know what else you'd like me to cover. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off.